Hi, I'm Finn, and in this video we'll be walking through the Natural Sciences Admissions Assessment, or the NSAA. And this is the admission assessment for Cambridge for applicants to Natural Sciences, Chemical Engineering, or Veterinary Medicine. So, quickly a bit about me, I'm a third year at St John's College, Cambridge, studying Natural Sciences. And we'll get straight into the exam structure. So it's one exam made up of two sections. The sections are given to you separately, but you complete them immediately, one immediately after the other. So section one, you get 20 multiple choice questions in maths, which is compulsory, and then you choose a science. So 20 more in biology, chemistry, or physics. And you get an hour for this. Section two is 20 slightly harder questions in biology, chemistry, or physics. So again, you get a choice. You don't have to do the same science in each one. You can do whichever combination you think you'll do best in. Um, in the first section, that gives you a minute and a half per question. And the second section, you have three minutes per question. So section two has slightly harder questions. The key takeaways from the specification. This can be found online. First thing you need to do before your revision is look at the specification and identify any areas of weakness you have and make sure you go over that and are confident with everything you could be asked. So there's no calculator allowed in either part of this exam. And there are four sections, maths, physics, chemistry, and biology. These are the standard sections. And for each section, there is an advanced section, advanced maths, advanced physics, advanced chemistry, or advanced biology. And the requirement for each section of the exam is given below. So section one, these are the slightly easier questions, 20 questions from maths, which are the mandatory ones. And then you pick one of physics, chemistry, or biology. And you can see for this, for maths, you need just the maths knowledge. Physics, you need physics and maths, chemistry and maths, biology and maths. Then for section two, part X, for physics, you need the advanced sections of maths and physics. But for chemistry, you only need advanced chemistry and similarly for biology. So if your strengths lie in maths and you do physics, you might want to think about doing physics for part X. Okay, so this is what you should be doing now. If you're just starting a revision, this is a good place to start and make sure you've done everything you need to do before you start your revision. First of all, make sure you're signed up. If you're not signed up, then you won't be able to do the test and your application to Cambridge won't be successful. So first of all, make sure you're signed up for the exam privately or through your school. Most schools are testing centers for these tests, but some aren't. And if your school isn't, then you need to go privately and find somewhere else to do that. The exam structure, which is what we've gone through, that's key. So just to review, section one is 20 questions from maths and then 20 questions from a science. You have one hour to do that. And section two is 20 questions from a science of your choice. Understanding the structure is really key so that when you come to the exam, you can do the best you can and you can allocate the correct time per question. You know what is coming up and it makes it a lot more approachable and less daunting if you know what's in the exam. Read the specification. So in the specification, you'll find that you have it divided into the standard maths, physics, chemistry, and biology and the advanced parts. Read each bit, each bit that you might do on. So if you're going to do physics or chemistry, read both sections, even if you don't think you're gonna do chemistry, um, just to be sure that you've read everything that you could possibly do. Choosing which section to do is important, and we'll get onto that later. Revise and learn anything you're weak on. Do this first of all. Find topics that you maybe haven't covered in a while since GCSE uh, and go over them. So for physics, this could be electromagnetism that's not really covered that much in first year available, but you did in GCSE. And you'll be expected to know the GCSE content. Past papers are your best resource. You need to use these as much as possible. Before the exam, you should aim to have done all the past papers. Track your progress and identify weaknesses. A really good way of doing this is in an Excel document or something where you have the year and then the sections of the paper that you did. So maybe part A of maths and then part C, which is the chemistry part. And you can see what mark you got, spread out the tests, and hopefully over time you see an improvement. So this advice is going to be applicable to all the sections. Firstly, they're all accessible with GCSE and A-level knowledge. In the interviews where you get pushed beyond your A-level knowledge, but it's really important for both that you have a very strong base in the GCSE and A-level content. 
This is what the admission tutors build on and try and stretch you beyond in the interview and the admission test is solely on GCC and A-level content. There won't be anything that you haven't covered in your studies in school. High time pressure practice to time. As I've said, if you don't practice to time, there's really no point doing it at all because the questions are quite accessible. If you have as much time as you want on the questions, most applicants will be able to do them. The tricky part is getting it done to time. So every pass paper you do, practice it to time. And if you don't finish, mark where you've got to and complete the rest afterwards. All questions are multiple choice, so you can make a better guess. You can rule out options or think about which answers make sense. Decide on which parts to do before the exam. So when you go into the exam, you don't really have enough time to read through the physics, chemistry and biology sections and decide which one you'll do because you think it looks easier on the day. So what this means is you have to go into the exam already knowing which sections you're going to do. To find out which sections are best for you, when you're practicing, complete all sections that you think might be relevant. So for me, when I was doing mine, I thought I might do physics or chemistry. I wasn't sure which one. Um, and then doing some practice papers, I found that I was slightly better in physics. Um, so I decided to go with that on the day, but it really could have been either. And you might find that you think you're better at one science, but actually you turn out to do better in the test at your weaker science. So do read that, especially for the questions in biology compared to maybe the physics and chemistry ones, because they require a lot less calculation. So you, you can do them slightly quicker if you have the required knowledge to do the biology ones. So common mistakes, important to look at those. Past papers are the best way to practice and consider spreading them out so you get an idea of progress over time. You want to be doing a couple, two or three at the start so you get really familiar with the structure and you know where to revise and what kind of questions you're looking for when you're finding revision resources. If you spread them out, then you can see progress over time and it's useful to have a couple to do nearer the exam date uh, to give you a really good lead up into it. At 2020, there was a change of specification. It's still worth doing papers before this because the questions, although they're not multiple choice, will be on very similar content and still useful for your preparation. There's lots of resources online. If you just search up multiple choice questions for A-levels or GCSEs, you'll find lots of resources and use this to the best of your ability. So for if you get a question wrong, I recommend making a flashcard for it, either on paper or in Quizlet and then having a bank of questions that you've got wrong in previous practice tests so you can go over and make sure you really iron out any weaknesses you have in your knowledge and don't make the same mistakes again. And that's the point of the practice is working out where you're weaker and then fixing those problems. Good, so we're now going to go into each section in a bit more detail. First off, we'll do the math section. Use the UK MT SMC papers. This is the senior math challenge. Um, they are multiple choice math questions, which are really useful to do. They basically give you lots of questions in maths, pitched at about the right level to practice for the NSAA. A. You can find a random question generator online, which is useful as it just gives you a resource that you can click, put in the difficulty, put in the number of questions you want, press go, and it gives you the multiple choice question. And the answer a worked answer not just the the answer it tells you um, why the answer is what it is if you get stuck multiple choice you see an a level questions uh, again this is what i said if you look online you'll be able to find lots so find as many questions as you can and do them as fast as possible exam technique i think looking at the topics ratio geometry and probability students are typically weaker on those ones compared to units algebra statistics and number which you should be pretty confident on um, just from your school studies, you, you will have picked it up over time. Because it's non-calculator, mental arithmetic is important. Brush up on this so you're quick. Get quick at algebra for similar reasons to save time. And drawing diagrams, sketching graphs is really useful to summarise the information. Okay, so quick example. This is from the part A, so the only purely math section of the NSAA. So the design is set up by joining the points which are one third of the way along the sides of a square. This forms a second square as shown. This process is repeated. Calculate the area of the fourth square as a fraction of the original square. So this is a good example to illustrate 
a possible approach to these kind of questions. Geometry is a really common topic that comes up, so it's well worth becoming confident with your manipulation of shapes and finding the desired lengths and areas. So immediately, I think, because it says the uh, intersection is a third of the way along the length, which is here, if we just make the side length of the larger square 3, which we can do without loss of generality, since scaling the square could make it to any dimensions. It's the same for a square of side length 3 as a side length of 1. Um, the area scaling relation is not affected by the starting size of the square. So we don't care. We'll just label it 3 without loss of generality. You can then see that that's 2 and that's 1, just from a third of the way along the sides of the square. Then from here, what we want to do is find the hypotenuse with Pythagoras' theorem. Then you can see the area of the inner square is root 5 squared, which is 5. The outer square is 3 squared, which is 9. So for each repetition, the area scale factor is 5 ninths. This inner square is 5 ninths the area of the larger one. Therefore, for the fourth square, we need to cube 5 ninths. As you repeat this once, gives you the second square, do it again, gives you the third, and the third time gives you the fourth square. So 5 cubed over 9 cubed is 125 over 729. So C. Great. Sorry, we missed the exam technique. So exam technique. I recommend, again, as the same in maths, draw a diagram. It's really useful for summarizing information. You label on lengths, label on speeds. Um, it means you don't have to keep referring back to the question and finding the little bit of information you want. You can look at the diagram and it's summarized. Highlight numeric information. Again, underline this or put in your diagram and it will mean it's quicker for you to find it. When to work with numbers and when to work with symbols. So this is something that would help you save time. So just working with symbols is useful for lots of long algebraic manipulation. I recommend doing this for SUVAC questions, for example. If you start with the symbols, you know what you're looking for, you can rearrange and then plug in the numbers. Um, but then maybe for, for the math section, working with numbers for probability. And there might be similar questions in physics where just using the numbers is quicker and you don't need lots of working. So start off using symbols and then if you want to save time, go to numbers just to save yourself that extra few seconds. This is an example question from physics. Displacement time graph, what is the speed of the wave? Very standard, period is two seconds. As we can see, one period is the wave starts here and goes back to its original position after two seconds. We then find the frequency as one over the time period and C is F lambda. This is an equation you should know. If you don't know it, then definitely learn it. Um, because this is the kind of equation you'll have to know of by heart for the NSAA. And 0.75 centimetres per second. Good. So the answer is C. Into chemistry. Again, resources Isaac Physics also has some chemistry questions. Well worth using these. I think the best resource is probably this C3L6, which is the Cambridge challenge for students in lower sixth. They extend past first year of A-level. Um, and they are really the, the kind of level you should be looking at to prepare for the NSAA and for admission tests um, in general, if you apply elsewhere that requires an admission test. And the interview as well is, is really well helped um, by doing some past Cambridge Chemistry Challenge questions. If you're looking for harder versions of these questions, maybe find them too easy, then go on to the Chemistry Olympiad, which you'll do in Year 13, um, which are harder versions. So even better preparation for the interview. Multiple choice questions for A-level online. Practicing multiple choice is useful. Um, well worth doing this too. So the exam technique, chemical equations, often writing them out can help show you what's going on. You can work out the molar ratios from the equation. Often useful. Um, if you try and shortcut too much, there's also a risk that you get it wrong and make a silly mistake in calculation. So doesn't take long to write out, but I recommend doing that. Confidence with quantitative chemistry. This is the number one point. You should be very, very good at doing calculations with moles and concentrations um, because these are the questions that come up most often. So quantitative chemistry, those quick calculations should be second nature to you by the time you do the test. And if it's not by now, I'd recommend going over it again. So an example question. 
An oxide of iron has a formula Fe304 and contains both Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus ions. Which one of the following is the fraction of iron ions that are in the Fe2 plus state? So immediately we recognize that the oxide ion has a charge of minus two. So four times minus two is minus eight because we've got four oxygens in the formula. We then need to balance this charge with positive eight from the ion. So we need to find three iron ions that have a combined charge of plus eight. And the options are plus three or plus two from those constituent ion ions. So pretty quick to realize that three plus three plus two is eight. So you then have 2, 3 plus, 1, 2 plus gives you an overall charge of 8. So you have a ratio of 2 to 1 or a third is in the Fe2 plus state. Great, so on to the last option, which is biology. Resources. Again, A level multiple choice. You can use this for any of the topics and it's useful. There are many websites um, that sometimes divide it into topics and put a topic as a multiple choice section, which you can just complete target your revision a bit more and focus on the areas that you're weaker. I'd say UK Biology Olympiad is your number one resource as these are multiple choice questions pitched at the right level and doing lots of them will improve your biology skills. Quizlet flashcards, again, if you look on Quizlet and look up A-level biology, there are lots of flashcards, so use those. Senior Biology Challenge, again, kind of like the Biology Olympiad, um, both I think has multiple choice questions. Senior Biology Challenge is easier than the Biology Olympiad. Um, so do those questions, pick the one that you think is right for you in your stage of revision. Okay, so now onto the exam technique. One point for biology is more knowledge, less calculation. I said this at the start and I'll repeat it now. For biology, it's more what you know rather than a calculation to get to the answer. For physics, there'll definitely be, especially in section two, so the second paper you get, There'll definitely be many steps or two or three steps to the calculation. You won't just be able to learn something, read it in a textbook, remember it, and then regurgitate it. With biology, you will be able to do that. You'll say something and you'll be able to go, yeah, that's true, yes, that's false, um, and get the answer much more directly. They'll often ask questions where there are different options and you'll have to say uh, one and two are true, or only one is true to make it take a bit more time, otherwise it'd be it'd be too easy just to have one answer. So less calculation, but it's really important that you know what you're meant to know. So get the A-level revision done early rather than after your admission test. So an example from biology, the graph shows how body temperature of a human varies over a period of 60 minutes. What, which of the following could have caused the temperature change between X and Y? So this is a temperature drop. That's all the important thing we need to know from the question. We don't really care about any of this. We don't need to know what the exact temperature is. We just see that 38 is the highest one, 35 is the lowest. Worth checking the scales in case they've done something funny and put it the other way around, um, which they probably wouldn't do, but there's always a chance. And we can see that X and Y is a decrease. So given the options, we need to see which of these would cause a decrease in body temperature. Number one, homeostasis causing more sweat production. Well, as you know, sweat is produced, it then evaporates and takes heat away from the body. So one is a possibility, one's correct. Looking at two, the temperature control center of the brain causing hairs on the skin to stand up on end. Well, that is to do with temperature control, but hairs standing up on end trap more air and act as an insulating layer, so it would keep your temperature high. It would not cause you to cool down. So that's incorrect. Number three, the temperature control center in the brain causing less blood to flow near the skin's surface. Again, causing less blood flow into the surface would actually cause your body temperature to increase. Because blood flow to the surface means that your blood contains a lot of the heat of your body. Increasing its flow to the surface means that its heat can be conducted away. But constricting its flow to the surface, as is described in three, would cause an increase in body temperature rather than this reduction we see here. So three is also correct, incorrect. So it has to be B, one only. Thank you for watching. I hope that was a helpful summary of the Natural Sciences Admission Assessment and best of luck for the admission assessment and your application as a whole.